John Hutchinson has had, by any measure, a wonderful flying career. From his post-war start on Harvard's through such classic aircraft as the Shackleton, the Boeing 707, the Boeing 747, the Vickers VC-10 and the iconic supersonic transport aircraft, the Concorde, he has spent more time at Mach 2 than most military pilots. We talked to him about his book, The Wind Beneath My Wings. I'm here to talk to John Hutchinson about his marvellous life and your fabulous book, John. So thank you very much indeed for letting us come to speak to you today. Oh, it's a great pleasure, Nick. It's nice to see you. Thank you. I'm going to fire straight off with uh, the first questions. And uh, I'm, I'm really trying to pick areas uh, of the book that you might not have discussed before and that uh, particularly piqued my interest. But uh, the first thing I noted was that you were brought up uh, in India during a fascinating period of history. Um, the partition of India and Pakistan, the handing over of uh, uh, India, or the, the India moving from uh, previous control of the British Empire. Uh, how much do you think your early life moulded your uh, the person you have uh, become? What an interesting question. What I'll say to start with is that it was fascinating. My father was in the Indian Army. He was a colonel. He was the archetypal Indian Army colonel. And he spent the 1930s up and down the northwest frontier. Oh, wow. That's places been brilliant. like Gilgit and Fort Sandeman and all these places. And the, the great fear was that the Russians would come in into India through Afghanistan. Mm. Um, Second World War came. And dad was reassigned to sort of staff duties. And at the end of the war, as we started going into the business of partition, uh, he worked under Mountbatten um, up in Simla. Um, Shimla, I suppose I should say now. And um, uh, I have to say he had very little time for Mountbatten. He didn't like him at all. Uh, he thought he was a rather pompous man who was a bit full of himself but there we are that's another story um, but my memories of India all my mates were Indians there weren't any other boys of my age around who were white so you know I grew up with Indians and I I can remember for instance in the winter they used to flood the tennis courts in Simla and that became the ice skating rink. It was that cold? It jolly well was. It's about oh, wow. 7,000 feet up in the Himalayas. Well, not many people would have thought that. No, no, no. It's very cold. I mean, there was one winter when they had so much snow that the railway station subsided, collapsed under the weight of <laughs> snow. I'm not kidding. I remember. That was the winter of 1947, I think. 46 into 47. Um, and I used to sit in our house looking down on the tennis court and wait for the red balloon to be hoisted, indicating that the skating rink was fit for duty. <laughs> I love and it. I'd go down there and I'd spend the day skating with all these Indian mates of mine. So the business of sort of color, oh, and, and I've, you know, I've, I've, it's quite interesting. In, in the last year or two, there's been all sorts of comments about the role of the British in India and really rather sort of hostile criticism. Mm -hmm. All I can tell you is that I never saw any of that at all. Um, our servants were part of our family. And I remember when our ayah, our nanny, who almost was my surrogate mother, I mean, she looked after me more than my mother did, to be perfectly frank. I can remember dad taking her off to the railway station to put her on a train to go to what is now Pakistan. Mm. She was in tears. We were in tears. I mean, it was saying goodbye to a member of our family. Mm. And I will never know to this day whether or not she ever survived that journey because yeah. those trains used to get ambushed and they'd all be slaughtered. I mean, mm. the killing that went on in during partition 
was absolutely on a monumental scale. It really was. Uh, but none of it was directed towards the Brits. It was all Hindu, Muslim. But being part of that, uh, so, do you think it made a, you so a stronger how, person? So how did it mould my life subsequently? This, that, that's a very difficult... For a start, race isn't an issue with me. You know, I mean, I'm, to me, I've always been used to... Uh, the whole concept of sort of racism is something I can, is really to me quite foreign. Um, so I suppose that's one one effect it had on me. Um, I suppose the sort of uh, this isn't really India. The, this is more my family sort of upbringing, which was very strict and, um, and you know, a very disciplined environment. Um, that carried me through in very good stead when I joined the Royal Air Force, I suppose. Discipline was something I was sort of used to. <laughs> Excellent. It's interesting. Of your schooling, you wrote in the book, I knew how much work I would have to do to be able to join the RAF. I did the minimum amount necessary, which I loved. Uh, what's your advice nowadays to those thinking of uh, making a career for themselves in aviation? I would say don't do the minimum amount <laughs> necessary. <laughs> go, go for broke and do as much as you possibly can. Excellent. <laughs> because it's such a competitive world now, isn't it? Yes. I mean, when I came onto the scene in 1955, you could grandly look around and survey the scene and think, oh, I'll be a doctor or this or that or the next thing. And it, it was just a totally different world. Um, but I never wanted to be anything else other than an RAF pilot. I don't blame you. I see you started your flying training in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And that's a fairly remote place, but once uh, you you must have uh, flown over it later in your life, perhaps on a, a route, say to San Francisco or somewhere. What memories did that bring back as you were sitting on your 747 looking down? I never want to see Moose Jaw ever again in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was it was a fantastic place for a flying training school. It was about 40 miles, 50 miles north of the U.S. border had a tremendous reputation in the Prohibition era, era oh, wow. because the Americans would all flood across the Canadian border and buy their booze in Moose Jaw. And it was all, <laughs> I mean, they had saloon bars with all these sort of swing doors and things, just like you see in a Western. Oh, that must in be Western. fabulous. Um, but it was as flat as a pancake. Uh, the roads either went north, south or east, west. Um, if you got lost, all you did was fly down low level in your Harvard until you came past a grain elevator and all the grain elevators had the name of the little settlement painted on the side of the grain elevator and you then found that on your map and there you were you now knew how to get home back to moose jaw so it, it was it was a fabulous place from a flying training point of view but the weather i mean the weather was good in flying terms probably 75 80 percent of the time and then it was so bad that you couldn't possibly consider flying. There was sort of no in-betweens. Um, but the temperatures, I mean, in the summer it would get up to plus 40 and in the winter minus 40. And, you know, you could feel your nose freezing up as you breathed air in through your nose. You did not breathe in through your mouth in those sort of temperatures. You breathe through your nose to avoid sort of freezing your lungs up. I guess you had to do survival courses in case you jumped out uh, in the in the bush, as it were. Funny enough, I didn't do a survival course until I'd got my wings and finished my flying training. <laughs> and then I did the survival course. Perhaps they considered bit, you expendable bit, up to that bit point. Back to front, yes. isn't it? <laughs> I would have thought so. Oh, I like that very much. Now, despite your ambivalent feelings towards uh, Moose Jaw, you seemed as if your intense pa intense passion for the joys of uh, flying blossom there yeah i had a very difficult time to start with um i mean i had a very unforgiving instructor bear in mind i was at this stage 18 and a half i'd never driven a car 
I was very immature, quite frankly. Um, and to be presented with a Harvard as your ab initio trainer is quite, it is quite a challenge. I mean, it's a big lump of metal, a mm. Harvard. Powerful too. And powerful. And it had vices, you know, it would flick stall, uh, tip up on its nose, no trouble at all, ground loop on landing, no trouble at all. Aye. Had all sorts of little vices to catch you out. Um, and I did my first test. It was called the preliminary clearhood test at 15 hours, and I failed it comprehensively. So I was now sort of under review for, for the chop, and I was reassigned a different instructor who is a completely different kettle of fish, and he just built up my confidence, and then it took me about 23 hours to go solo, something like that, 23, 24 hours, and he sent me solo, and then shortly after that, something clicked. I don't know what it was. The hand-eye coordination suddenly clicked, and I have never, ever looked back on a course since. With, I've never had any problems with any course since. You know, it, it gave me a tremendous grounding, the Harvard, and I think my sort of moral of that story would be that if you could fly a Harvard, you could sort of more or less fly anything. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Nowadays, trainers seem to be very benign. Uh, and I wonder sometimes if that's the right way around. As an ex-flying instructor, I would totally agree with that. My last three years in the Air Force was instructing on Jet Provost, yeah. which is incredibly benign. Yeah. And I think you yourself went on to follow Nats, if I if I That's right, heard yes. it all correctly. Yeah. Um, and going from a jet provost to a fallen gnat was a quantum leap, Yeah, which was... you probably weren't really properly prepared for. <laughs> but luckily we all survived.